afternoon, everyone. Before we get started, I'd like to give special thanks to our CS 50th anniversary sponsors, in particular to PIMS and One Qubit, who are sponsoring this lecture series and responsible for us getting Ranjit here. So today I'm pleased to introduce Ranjit Jala. Ranjit is a professor at UCSD <coughs> who's been working on improving the safety and reliability of software. Ranjit's work includes uh, a long track record of automated verification techniques. Ranjit has recently won the Robin, Millier, Robin Milner Young Researchers Award, which is a, an ACM SIGPLAN award for his outstanding contributions to programming languages. <coughs> so recently, these include work on browser verification, verified distributed systems, and what we'll be hearing about today, uh, techniques for <coughs> lightweight, integrating lightweight theorem proving and verification <coughs> to languages such as Haskell and JavaScript. So, Ranjit, tell us about language integrated verification. Is this on? Okay, I guess it is. Uh, th first of all, thank you very much for this invitation. It's uh, truly a great pleasure and honor to be here. I apologize, my throat is not at its best, but it is what it is, and I'll try to be loud. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm I'm going to tell you about something I've been working on for nearly ten years now. Um, it's this sort of broad notion of what I call language integrated verification. Though I came up with this particular term just maybe a few months ago. And before I tell you about this, let's just begin with a little bit of history, a little pop quiz. Does anyone know what this is? Have you seen this picture before? A little bit of trivia? What is it? It is a bug, yes, of course it's a bug. Um, that doesn't, yeah. Oh. It is, in fact, not the first bug. So I gave this talk elsewhere, and some very fastidious person in the audience pointed out it is not, in fact, the first bug. It is the first found bug, okay? <laughs> Uh, it is the first actual case of a bug being found. This is a bu bug with, uh, you know, this bug report was filed by no less than, uh, than Grace Hopper, right? Um, this was, an, in fact, a dead moth found in the relay of the Harvard Mark II. So this was, of course, back in the day, uh, fast forward to the, the modern era, and, you know, you don't have to look so hard to find bugs, right? Just open, you know, your daily newspaper. You'll hear about some major system having crashed, some city having come to a halt, a hospital being held hostage, who knows what. Right? Um, so bugs are really everywhere. And so what is it that people like me work on? So I'm, I and you know, many of your, uh, well, some of your colleagues like Ron and Will, I don't want to speak for Ron and Will, okay, let's, let's keep them out of it, poor things. Um, what many of us work on in, in the sort of broad field of programming languages research is actually summed up by this gentleman, <clears throat> George Orwell. Um, and if you haven't read his book, 1984, you should. Why would anybody not? Why would anyone not have read 1984? In 1984, George Orwell wrote this, uh, these wonderful lines, right? He writes, we shall make thought crime literally impossible. There will be no words to express it. <laughs> and nothing sums up programming languages research as nicely, in my opinion, <laughs> as that one sentence, George Orwell. That is literally what we want to do, OK? We don't call it thought crime, OK? We maybe want to call it bugs. We can call it thought crime, because frank frankly, it's a far more compelling word than bugs. Um, but maybe it has a not so good connotation. But anyway, this is what um, a lot of people like me work on, right? We want to make it really, really hard for you to write programs with bugs in them. Maybe even to think about these things. So well, this is not a particularly novel notion. Um, you know, 1984 came out in what, like 1944, right? Or 48, as I recall. Um, actually, some of the earliest papers on the subject of verification came out around the same time. Alan Turing was writing uh, papers uh, even as he was working on the halting problem, he came up with many of the basic ideas that underpin a lot of sort of program verification research. But in the intervening decades, we've come up with lots of really cool techniques. So the things like SMT solvers, also known as decision procedures, uh, the symbolic execution. Many of you sort of work on some of these things as abstract interpretation, as model checking, as theorem provers, as proof assistants. There's all kinds of cool stuff, right? And yet I argue that these have all had somewhat limited impact and adoption. Now, some of this can be explained just by, well, it's a matter of time, you know. What is that line about the future being not evenly distributed? Sure, sure, some of it is that. But I think there's, a, you know, there's other techniques that the PL world has sort of invented that have had far bigger adoption. Things like profilers or garbage collection or version control or sort of automated unit tests. So why is it that these things are so widely used and verification technology is not so widely used? So there's many reasons for this, of course. But one of those reasons, I believe, <coughs> is that much of the research world, um, that is, I blame people like me, we've set up the sort of 
possible consumers of our technology, or we've set up the world of programming uh, in a way where we've sort of created this somewhat artificial partition between, between users, okay? So there's on the one hand the programmer. The programmer is the person who's writing the system, who's building the thing you want. And the verifier is like this bureaucrat <coughs> who has to then somehow check that it's okay, okay? Um, so in a sense, the programmer writes the code and then hands it over to the verifier, which is, you know, nerds like me who are building clever analyses that will sort of automatically check that your code does good things or, you know, does not do bad things and so on and so forth. Now, this sounds like a nice separation of concerns, but in fact, it's a, it's a completely artificial wall. And I argue that this wall has sort of two severe, severe consequences. The first is that the programmer can't really affect how the analysis works. The programmer may care about very specific things about the code that he or she is writing, and they need a way to communicate this with the verifier, right? So not only the things that they want to have checked, but there may be specific idioms about their code, about why their code is actually okay, that they would like that, you know, that they would like the verifier to be aware of, right? And dually, perhaps this is the even bigger one, the verifier cannot influence the program. There's this kind of one-way thing where I hand it off to you, the verifier says, yeah, this looks good, and it goes into production or whatever, right? Um, instead, what we want is a more harmonious kind of unification of these two processes, where instead of thinking of it as eliminating or finding bugs after development, we just want to not put them in in the first place. We want to rig it so that as the programmer is writing their code or designing their system, they get some help with just, you know, staying on the straight and narrow, as it were. And this is, uh, so this will let you sort of both have the programmer analysis, influence the analysis. The programmer will say, hey, can you check these kinds of things for me, and these are why these things should be true. And dually, we want to close the loop and have the verifier influence um, the program itself, right? Maybe if you simplify the program a bit, things will work out more nicely. And this is what I'm calling language integrated verification, okay? So instead of thinking of program analysis as some separate tool, I want to just smash it into the language where the programmer is the analysis designer is the programmer, okay? Now let me tell you about some of the consequences of this, right? So in the program analysis work, uh, you know, that I've been doing for whatever, 20 years, and which, you know, many, there's like a whole community uh, that works on this. One of the things we obsess about is the notion of whether an analysis is precise. And what precise means is that we don't want to sort of burden the, you know, the, the user or the, the whoever it is with false alarms. So the analysis is, I don't like your program in these 40 places, and maybe only four of those are bugs, and the remaining 36 are not really bugs, right? So the remaining 36 are false alarms. So there's a lot of work on eliminating false alarms, making the analysis precise. But in fact, this particular kind of, um, what shall I say, obsession, I think is somewhat misguided, or if not misguided, it's only looking at a part of the picture. It's missing an entirely new dimension, which is the time at which you report the error, okay? I argue that the sooner you report it, if you tell me something looks sketchy as I am typing those characters out, well, you know what, I won't type those characters out. But if you tell me that same thing two weeks later, well, I don't care what you're saying. I'm not going to go back and change that thing. I wrote it two weeks ago. I'm not going to change it, right? Now, of course, this is what I believe, and I am but a humble academic. Um, but it turns out that over the last few years, there have been several very, very nice uh, industrial studies that have come out that show the same thing. Because there's a lot of sort of engineering going into building these kinds of tools now, there are very sort of, uh, there are nice checkers tailored to very specific kinds of properties that are being used now at Google and Facebook and so on and so forth. And there's some very cool studies. So for example, um, my buddy Manu Sridharan sort of used a tool out of UW called uh, the, the checker framework to build a null pointer checker for Java. Okay, I don't have to explain what a null pointer checker does. It sort of points out if there's null dereference errors. And what Manu and his colleagues found at Uber is that late feedback just made everybody unhappy. And if once they switched to a mode where they were giving you feedback right as you were programming, everybody loved it. It did not matter how precise or imprecise the thing was. That was not the most important thing. I don't want to say precision doesn't matter. Of course it matters. But really what the point I'm trying to argue is the earlier you give the feedback, the more it matters. Here's another one. It's a different study. This was a team at Google led by Caitlin Sadowski. Google developers perceive issues flagged at compile time as opposed to patches for checked in code as far more important, right? It's like the things that are compiled time are far more important. Participants deem 74% of the issues flagged at compile time as real problems versus the rest were like whatever, that's just 21%. Even more shocking, or I should say, you know, interesting, uh, was this result from Facebook. So Facebook has its own sort of static analysis tool called Infer. 
that again does sort of nullity reference checking and so on. What they found is they tried a batch deployment thing where they only give you, it runs overnight and gives you warnings the next day. Nobody wanted to look at those warnings. Like, thanks, thanks, but no thanks. They switched it so that now the warnings were reported at code review time, the fix rate shot up to 70%, from zero. Okay, so not like it went from 20 to 70, it went from zero. What is that, like an infinite um, improvement, okay? So really, what we want is the earlier we give this feedback, the better it can influence the program's design, okay? How can the programmer influence the analysis? So all the checkers I described, they were essentially looking at these very, very targeted things for sort of checking nullity references, <coughs> checking nullity references, and maybe checking nullity references. No, actually, it's not, that, not just that, right? They check some concurrency errors, races, and so on. But really, there's a lot of other things we care about in programs, OK? And who better to tell you what to care about in a program than the programmer themselves, OK? We don't want to have like one-off custom analyses. We really want the programmer to kind of close this loop for us. So we want the programmer to tell me not just what to analyze, like what properties we care about, but also how to go about the analysis. Maybe there are little domain-specific hints that the programmer can give us that would make the analysis tractable, OK? Um, and we want to essentially have it not just limited to nullity references, because that's sure, everybody cares, nobody likes a nullity reference, but nobody likes array bounds overflows either. No one likes integers to overflow, but then after that, I might be writing some custom data structure with its own invariants. I might be building a compiler that I want to prove things about. I might be building, who knows what, I might be building a web app which may have strange security uh, requirements. And I really don't, you know, I want to be able to do it all, right? I want to start at the very top and maybe specify all these extra things and maybe get these extra guarantees out. So this is a sort of holistic view of why I think we really need to merge verification and programming into one kind of, uh, one unified activity. And let me now next tell you how we've been approaching this particular problem, right? So hopefully I've given you some motivation for why we want this integration. Next I'll give you one approach that we've been, um, that we've been sort of investigating over the last decade on how to achieve this kind of language integrated verification. And I'll conclude with some lessons that we've learned over the last 10 years about what is easy, what is hard, and what is really, really hard. And you know, the things that I thought were the things that I thought were hard turned out to be easy, and many of the things that were turned out that I thought were not big problems are really the things that kind of annoy me the most now, and I don't really know how to solve. Okay, so next, how, how does one integrate languages and verification? So I'm gonna break this down into three parts. First, I'll tell you, as a programmer, how do you interact with the system, right? As a programmer, what do you type to make it check things, or how do you tell it to check stuff? Next, we'll sort of briefly peep under the covers to see how the verification actually works. Like what, what happened, you know, what, what are the underlying algorithms? Um, I'll be, you know, all of this is gonna be pretty high level, right? So I'll try to keep it self-contained and at a pretty high level. And then if there's time, I'll tell you a little bit about how we can sort of scale this up from checking relatively simple things like array bounds and, you know, user-defined invariants to arbitrary correctness properties of arbitrary code that you might write about, uh, uh, about your system, okay? So first, let's look at this issue of specification. And I'll, you know, to, I want to make good on my claim that you want to kind of walk down, you know, from the very basic things like null references all the way up to full functional correctness. And so I won't start with null references because those are not super exciting. I'll start with array bounds. Okay, so let me explain to you how we can, as, a pro, how as programmers, I can specify the notion of arrays must be accessed within bounds using a system called refinement types. Okay, that's my vessel, vehicle, if you wish, for integrating programming and verification. Okay, so what is a refinement type? I'm gonna assume that everyone knows what a type is. Perhaps this is not a found, well-founded assumption, but we must start somewhere. Okay, so I'm gonna assume everyone knows what a type is, and a refinement type is gonna look roughly like this. So this is deliberately written in a kind of set, setish notation. So read this as, the values x of the base type b, where base type is like integer, boolean, string, whatever, such that some predicate p holds, where p is some condition or constraint. Okay, so the set of values of type, uh, set of values x that are of type b, such that some condition holds. So here's an example. Okay, let's not uh, dwell on technical details. Let's cut right into a tech, uh, an example. I can say the type nat for natural numbers is defined as the set i of integers such that i is greater than zero. Everyone's okay with this? Okay. So now I'm gonna do this thing where each of these formulas is going to belong to a decidable logic. Okay, so we can, we can sort of talk for hours about what that means, but think of it roughly as 
there are fast decision procedures for reasoning about the formulas that I'm going to write in blue on the side there. Okay, that's all you really need to know about right now. Okay, set of integers i such that i is greater than zero. <coughs> okay, that's great. You can write the natural numbers. How do we go from natural numbers to array bounds? It seems like a bit of a stretch. Well, let's see how. In order to do that, I like to explain everything by example. So let's look at the example of, you know, just trying to do a binary search on an array to find a particular element. Okay? Here's what binary search looks like. So this is written in a language called Haskell, which you may or may not be familiar with. It's not terribly important to know what Haskell is. I think this code is mostly familiar to anyone who's written like binary search or has some familiarity with programming. So let's see what, I'll just break it down for you. Okay, so remember, first let me give you my cartoon illustration of binary search. I have an array, it's easier done this way. No, then I'm not facing you. I have an array like so. I'm trying to find the element seven or whatever. I'm trying to find some element apple. I'm trying to find the position at which apple lives in the array. And so I jump to the middle and I ask, hey, are you apple? And we want the array to be sorted, right? So, and I look at the thing in the middle, and it's like, no, I am in fact banana, okay? And so we're like, aha, apple must come before banana. So we sort of recur on the left half of the array because if apple's in the array, it must be in the left half. Instead, if instead of banana, there was, oh gosh, what's a fruit that starts with A that comes before apple? Let's just pretend, thank you, apricot <laughs> technically comes, after. let's pretend it's before, okay? Uh, <laughs> Uh, apricot, yes. just stick with me here, please. I like apricot, okay? Let's pretend it was apricot, then we know that uh, apple must come after apricot, so we recur on the right side, right? And keep repeating, and so on. So what does this look like in the code? Well, here's what it looks like. First, you compute the midpoint, so this is a function, so this, is, this little recursive function is the one that's doing the binary search. It says you start, um, so A is the element I'm looking for, V, the value I'm looking for, Vec is somehow in Haskell they like to call array vectors. I don't know why. But whatever. It's a vector, it's an array, it's not a big deal. Low and high are the lower and the upper bounds of the array that in which we're searching, right? So the first thing we do is find the midpoint, which is low plus high divided by two, it's right in the middle, right? Next, we check. I, I compare, hey, is the value that I'm looking for less than the midpoint? Is it less than apricot or is it uh, less than banana or whatever, right? So if the value I'm looking for is less than, then I recur on the left half. How do I recur on the left half? I set the new value of high to be the midpoint minus one, and then I recursively call the loop with this new value of high, right, high prime. If instead, the value that I was looking for is greater than the midpoint, then it must be on the right side, and so I recur on the right side, whoops, sorry, uh, by setting the low, I bump up the low to be midpoint plus one, and then I recur, and otherwise it must be that, aha, the value in the midpoint was the value that I'm looking for, and I just return mid as the position where we found the thing, right? So we keep recurring, um, and by the way, in each of these cases, there's also the base case where the loop has become too small, low has overdone, you know, low and high are basically have crossed over, in which case we didn't find it, so we return nothing, nothing is Haskell speak for null, if you wish, okay? <clears throat> And finally, this top level binary search function is the fellow that gets the ball rolling. Uh, it says call the loop on the value v that you're searching for with the initial low as zero and the high as the length of the vector. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Okay, good. Now, how do we specify in this that we don't want any array overflows? Okay, we must begin, let's just, how, how do we even write that? So what we do is we sort of stare at this code and we see that there's really two places where we're touching arrays. The first is where we compute the length of an array. Right? We're trying to extract its length. And the second is the point where we index into the array to see its, uh, to check what the value was at the midpoint, right? So really, there are two operators here that we care about, the length and the index function, okay? So here is the specification for the length function. So right now, the length function, you can just imagine it's a library function. Somebody's gonna have to write down a specification for how this function behaves. And let's see how, how we might write down a specification that essentially lets us talk about sizes and array bounds. So the length function says that I take as input v, which is a vector, and I return as output a number n, which is a nat, it must be in length, must be non-negative, such that the number n is equal to the length of v. So vlen is a function, for those of you who know what this word means, vlen is an uninterpreted function. If you don't know what it means, don't worry about it. It's just a function that says, I am the size of the vector v, okay? So vlen of v is the size of the vector v, where this is v. So far, so good, okay? So in the program verification world, this is often called a post condition, 
Okay, there's the output type. So this is a length is a function, and in, in Haskell, the thing to the left of the arrow is the input, and the thing to the right of the arrow is the output. And so what I'm doing is I'm putting a constraint or a refinement on the output type, which captures a post condition that says that the value that's returned is equal to the length of the input. Okay, good. Now let's look at the index function, which is used to read into the array, and this is where we'll specify the bounds property. So the index function, for whatever reason, is you can use whatever symbol you like. In the code that I had, it's written as this exclamation mark as an infix operator. Okay? You could just write at or get or whatever. Right? So the index function takes two inputs. It takes v, the vector that you're looking at, the index i. And it's a vector of a, so it's a polymorphic thing. So it can be a vector of whatever objects or any, it's like a generic type. And so the output is an a. Right? <coughs> the important thing over here is that now for the second input, we have a precondition that captures the essence of the array bounds property. It says that the input index must be between 0 and the vector's length, which is again our friend VLAN. Does this make sense? OK, so the index must be between 0, because you can't have like a negative index, um, and the vector's length. OK, cool. So far, so good. So in order to specify array bounds, this is all you need. You need to basically tell the system, hey, there's a thing called length that returns the length of the vector. And there's a thing called index, which needs a value that's between 0 and, and uh, the length. Okay? Specifically, this is what it might look like. So you go back to the bi binary search code. And of course, it's in the libraries of specification. But to make this self-contained, I'm writing it out over here. Right? You sort of type it out. Hey, exclamation mark has that type, and length has that type. And when you do that, the system says, oh, well, then in that case, I'm a bit dubious about these two accesses to the vector. I don't like them at all. And why not? We'll come back to this later, but can someone tell me why not? There's actually something weird about this code. It's a bit hard to spot. It looks correct, but it's not. There's, a, there's like a weird off by one. Yes? Mid can go out of range because it's a low plus high, right? So it can be like a buffer, integer overflow sort of thing. Oh, there can be an integer overflow. OK, there could be that. That's possible. We'll, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge in due course. Let me just defer that. You're, getting, you're, you're like talking about really complicated things. There's something simpler that's already b wrong about this. Could be negative. What could be negative? Uh, low and high. Low and high could be negative. Not really, because low starts with 0 and high starts with length of vec. So both of those are non-negative. And we only kind of, yeah, we're not really negativing them. So. Integer. Right. But everything is an integer, but it's, you could, the, I'm not showing you the refinement because it's being inferred. But if you squint at it, it's always non negative. So pay no attention to that, is just for you to see that that's an integer. I'm not showing you the refined type. I'm not showing you because I didn't write it down, because it was inferred by the system. But it's not really negative. Yeah? So what's the index origin? You, are your, is your index origin 0 or origin 1? Index? It's 0, but that's you're getting, you're getting warmer, yes. So the index is, uh, is 0. And I mean, that's a language question, isn't it? It starts at 0. The array is indexed by 0, oh, yes. It starts at 0. Yeah. So, so you might be 1 off the end. I don't know. In, yes. Um, I'm just guessing maybe mid might not actually be an integer, but you can divide it by 2. Oh, you're worried? No, this is all on in, so the div operation is going to round it down to whatever the nearest integer was. But yes? I have a question. Um, so the mat is defined as between 0 and length, right? So if mid ever comes down to 0, that's going to be a problem based on the problem. So when is it a problem if mid is 0? Why are you all freaked out about the fact that mid is 0? What could be bad if mid was 0? Array is well, like 0. What's that? If array is empty. If the array is empty. Yeah. Exactly so, right? Nobody checked that the array was not empty, and you can have an empty array. That's a thing, okay? And so that's the problem here, okay? And so somewhere, I mean, that is a bona fide out of bounds error because nobody checked that, okay? And so in fact, there's two bugs. One is the array might be empty. The second is because the indexing is at zero, we want high not to go all the way to length vec, but to length vec minus one, okay? And so now, what would you do as the programmer? Well, first of all, you would have to scratch your head and try and figure out why you got those errors. But once you crack that particular puzzle, you're like, OK, I got it. So I must check that the length is, in fact, greater than 0. And I must change that thing so that it's length vec minus 1. And otherwise, you know, I have to return nothing, right? Because the array is empty. There's nothing in it. And the moment you do that, hallelujah, everything is great. OK, all the pink stuff goes away. OK? So that's nice. But now, 
Um, so, so far so good? Everyone's happy about this? There's no complaint? Okay, cool. So now let's see if we get to your problem, which is you don't like this. You're like, wait, high plus low is going to overflow and that's like, I don't like addition. You know, like I'm always worried when people add numbers because you're just kind of paranoid, okay? <laughs> so this is a fairly good thing to be paranoid about. So let's see, how would we talk about integer overflows? Where does that even enter the picture? So here's what you would do, okay? Same game. Now we must go to the plus and minus operations and somehow specify that arithmetic is bounded. So how should we do that? Well, here's how. So I, what I want to do is I want to define a notion of bounded integers, right? So I'm going to pretend that there's some constant called max int, which is of type int, and I don't really particularly care what that number is. Let's just pretend there's a constant called max int. And I'm going to say that a number n is bounded if n is basically between negative max int and positive max int. <coughs> Roughly speaking, that's what that thing is saying, okay? Now what I'm going to say is I'm going to hack the type of plus and minus. Just like I changed the, I'm going to refine, sorry, hack is not the word, <laughs> refine the type of plus and minus so that instead of just saying, oh, they take two integers and return integers, I actually capture this information about boundedness. So let's see what this bounded spec says. It says that the plus operator, minus is symmetric, so we won't pay too much attention to it. The plus operator takes x, which is any old integer, and it must take as input a y such that the logical addition of x and y is in fact a valid bounded thing. Okay, you can't add the two and whoa, end up outside the range of max n, okay? Or below the range of max n. And as long as this precondition is met, the value that is returned is in fact equal to x plus y. So this is a very rigid specification. You can imagine other specifications that say, it's fine if they're not bounded, all bets are off, right? The value that's returned is some weird wraparound thing. You could imagine specifying, you could imagine various different specifications, right? This is just saying, by God, you will never have an uh, overflowing arithmetic operation or so help me, you will get a type error. That's what they're saying, okay? Okay, back to our, back to the bat cave, let's see. How would I now check this? I would just say, hey, take that spec that I wrote in that separate file and just import bounded num. And so now what's happening is it's just checking plus and minus and all those things using those, that stronger thing for, uh, for, for, uh, for arith arithmetic, right? And now sure enough, you get all these nasty errors. Oh my God, length of vec minus one might overflow and mid minus one might overflow and plus one might overflow and low plus high might overflow. Okay, so it looks really desperate. Um, but of course it's not so bad because if you think about it, the programmer knows that this mid was between low and high, uh, sorry, between zero and the length of the vector, right? And the length of the vector must be between zero and max int. How the hell could you have created a vector that was larger than max int? In fact, you can't, as it happens, right? So this is what I meant by you want the programmer to be able to, hey, hey, analysis, don't freak out. Let me, here, let me clue you in, okay? And so here's what I would do. I would tell the analysis, remember, that the length of a vector is always a max int. So that's how, uh, that's how the, here, here's what I would type, right? I would say something like, hey, by the way, use the fact that whenever you have a vector, the size of the vector is in fact a bound int. Okay, it's not an unreasonable thing to say. And now when you do that, okay, all those others go away. And now we are left with, what was your name again? Uh, RT. RTs. Well, now we're left with RTs. The thing that's been bugging RT is low plus high. Ah, that looks dodgy. Okay, and the system still doesn't like it. And perhaps RT has seen this before and perhaps RT is just very, very perspicacious. This is in fact a valid integer overflow, okay? Um, there was a famous kind of blog post like 10 years ago. This guy, Joshua Block, who wrote a large part of the Java standard libraries, wrote this thing. Uh, you can Google this if you like. Nearly all binary searches and merge sorts, including his, are broken because they were all using this code, low plus high. If you think about it, low plus high could both be really, really close to max int because of how binary search has worked. And now you add them together and wham. Yes, you're going to do a division by two, but by then it's too late. You did the, the addition and so all bets are off. And so in fact, what Joshua Block says is never do low plus high. Instead, do low plus high minus low. <laughs> I mean, think about it for a moment. This is apparently, well, you know, apparently everything stays within bounds. And sure enough, the pink stuff goes away. Okay? High minus low is always happy. Low plus that, it, it all works out. Okay? Question, yes. But back to your little spec, mm -hmm. bounded spec. You're not the, concerned. This one? No, the, the, on that. The previous slide? Uh, yeah, the, the uh, one where you say you spec the plus operator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> You're still going x plus y or whatever in that spec, and that itself will be illegal if you oh, go over. I, I was just, it, it won't. So sorry, this is my, my apologies. <laughs> my apologies. There are two pluses here. 
PL, P, PL people are always used to this kind of overloading. The plus that was on the spec is the mathematical plus. It's the logical plus. There's no overflows over there, right? Oh. It's the one that's in the logic that never overflows. This is the plus that's in the code, and that can overflow. So there is this distinction, and I, maybe I should use different okay, so fonts. Integration into the language doesn't mean you're using the language as operators completely. Exactly. We're just kind of abusing the language's syntax, if you wish. Uh, but that, the plus that's up in the logic land is like mathematical logic. That's happy logic. That never overflows. This one can overflow. Yeah, we're not using that. OK? This is very much a frequently asked question. I must make a note of this. OK, very good. Um, so fantastic. So I just showed you two examples, array bounds and integer overflows, right? And we just kind of you know, incrementally sort of build it up by adding these extra things. Next, let me give you a little peep under the cover. Let me check the time. Half an hour has passed. I'm only 15 minutes over time. OK. Um, <coughs> next, let me sort of peep under the cover and tell you a little bit about how the verification works. OK? So now, I have, I, I have a bit of a confession, which is that everything I described to you, except for the use of CSS and syntax highlighting, was all known about 40 years ago. OK, 50 years ago. 50-ish, I think, if I'm doing my math correct. So this is what is known as classic sort of Floyd Horse style verification, named after Bob Floyd and, Robert, uh, and uh, Sir Tony Hoare, who invented it. So back in the day, they didn't have like fancy editors with like, you know, edit syntax highlighting. Instead, Bob Floyd had to sort of painstakingly scratch out little flow charts. This was his program. Not quite sure what he's doing. He's probably adding up some numbers. Oh, flow chart to compute the addition of the numbers from 0 through n. And these are all, you know, the equivalent of what I'm even calling refinements. They're called invariants at each of those program points. And Bob Floyd had to sort of write those invariants down and they had to be checked by, by hand. And then 10 years later, Bob Floyd's buddies um, in the Stanford Pascal Verifier team, they built many of the decision procedures that we sort of still use or use sort of variants of. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Greg Nelson in particular sort of invented a lot of the decision procedures that we even used in the code that I showed you, right? However, there is a big difference in the work that I showed you, which is, and I'll sort of come to that sort of more in detail, is that it worked for those examples simply because they were what we call first order programs. You could have written that program in like C 30 years ago or whatever, right? It's just like, it's mostly just a simple recursive function. And all of those things break down once you start using slightly more modern idioms for in your programming language. The kinds of things that are now, you know, when I started teaching at UCSD 15 years ago, I had to go to great pains to sort of motivate things like map. There's this curious function called map, and there's this funny little operator called fold, which some people also call reduce. But two years later, the Google map reduce paper came out, and then big data happened, and now everyone's programming with map and reduce. Okay? So every language has some, some implementation of map and fold and so on and so forth. Java, for God's sake has a lot of these things built in now. It has lambdas, OK? And all of these break down in the classical Floyd Horse style because it gets really, really cumbersome. And so instead, what a lot of this work that I'm going to show you uses this new, new trick called, um, what, what did I call it? Liquid types, which is a form of type-directed abstract interpretation. So let me, that's a lot of words. Let me just explain it by example, OK? So here's my example. I'm going to pick a really, really simple program that should be pretty easy to follow. What the program does is it takes a list, it takes a vector of doubles, and it squares each element inside that vector and then adds up all those, uh, all the squares, okay? So sum of squares takes a vector, and what does it do? Well, it generates a list zero through length of x minus one. We don't want that pesky off by one again. And for each index i, it accesses the vector at the position i, squares it, and so this generates a collection, a list of xi squares, right? And then the sum function just squares it. So this is basically the same thing as what Bob Floyd's flowchart was doing, but I dare say in a somewhat easier to, uh, more obviously kind of correct form, OK? OK, fantastic. So now, how did you saw that little pink flicker, right? There was a little error, and then I made this minus 1. It went away. How exactly did the system check this? So it turns out that this very simple function, you could write the same thing in Python. It would look more or less the same, right? And maybe instead of double star, it's like the caret operator or whatever. Underneath the covers, this simple one line gets transformed into something a little more complicated. Okay, it looks a bit like this. Here's the intermediate representation that you get um, in sort of any language. It doesn't really matter what the, in Python or JavaScript or whatever in Haskell. So sum of squares of a vector x, here's what happens. There are sort of three uh, steps over here. The first thing is that the 0 through length of x minus 1 generates a collection 
in Python it's called range, for example, right? So this generates a range of values, a collection of values, a list of values between zero and whatever this length of x minus one, thing one. Next what happens, we compute this xi squared. What this does is it actually generates a little function, a lambda function, an anonymous function that I'm naming here, I'm calling it body, uh, that takes an input i and returns as output x at i squared, right? The vector x at the index i squared, okay? So now we've got this extra function. And finally, the third thing that happens is we compute this, uh, we compute this collection, but this collection is the result of <coughs> mapping this body function across this whole list i's. Okay, so what does map mean? It means it sort of says it in the type. It says, give me a function that converts apples into bananas, give me a collection of apples, and I will give you back a collection of bananas. How? I'll run that function on each apple one by one and turn them into bananas. Okay, so that's what this is doing. And this gives me the element v's, which is now a list of numbers that I then pass into sum that takes a list of doubles and adds them all together, gives me a double. Okay, sort of breaks it down into these three things. And now this is where the Floyd Hoare style totally breaks down because it's like these weird higher order functions, there's map, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with map, there are these collections and so on. But it turns out that instead of using the Floyd Hoare style, you sort of combine it with types, it becomes super easy to check. And I'll explain how that happens, okay? So here's what we're going to do. The analysis roughly works like this. I start with my code, as I just showed you, and then essentially I do type checking on it. Okay, so I do type checking, except in addition to doing the type checking, I also produce something called a horn constraint, which is a fancy word, and I'll explain what a horn constraint is in just a second, okay? Then I'm gonna take these horn constraints and I'm gonna send them into this abstract interpretation engine, which is essentially think of it as a meat grinder that can solve these horn constraints via abstract interpretation, okay? So I'm gonna skip over all of this. I'll just show you what the horn constraints are. And you'll have to trust me that some black box exists that does this latter thing. Okay, cool. So let's look at how this type checking produces horn constraints. So here's what's gonna happen. <coughs> now let's, let's pretend we're type checking this code. Okay, the range function, it was a library function, and the range function I already gave it a type that looks something like this. It takes an n, an integer, an m, and it returns as output a collection of values v that are between n and m. Okay, seems pretty straightforward, right? Takes a low and a high, and it gives me back a collection of numbers between low and high. Okay, great. So if that's what the type of the range function is in general, in this particular use, what value are we passing in for n? Zero. And what value are we passing in for m? The length of x minus one, right? So vlen of x minus one. And so the type that we get for i's is, i must be a collection of integers that are greater than zero and less than vlen x minus one. Okay, I just substituted the n and the m for the actual values that were passed in. That's just how type checking works, okay? Next, let's look at this body. Now, body is a peculiar fellow because here's a function. It's a disembodied function. Um, it takes an input i and it accesses the array x at, at the index i and then squares it. Now, I don't know what index i this is gonna be called with. I'm just like, I'm just defining a function, okay? How do I know what inputs are? Are they naturals, are they non-naturals? Are they evens, are they bananas? Having the foggiest idea. So whenever, during type checking, I don't know what the type of something is, I'll make up a variable for it. Okay, it's like how my mom taught me how to do algebra, what the purpose of algebra was. When you don't know something, x is the unknown, okay? So here, k is going to be the unknown. And I'm gonna say, okay, body is a function that takes an input, an integer i, such that k of i, k is some predicate, I don't know what k is, it's some variable, I don't know what it is, and it returns as output a double. How do I know it's a double? Because I'm squaring that double vector of doubles, and, and that's always a double. Okay, so I'm simplifying things a little bit, just pretending it returns as output a double. Okay, cool. So body is this weird function that takes a k of i, returns a double, and then in that case, if that's what the type of body is, then what must the type of i be? i is an integer such that k of i, right? Okay, because that's what we said. I don't know what the, it's, it's unknown, so it's just k of i. Okay, so here are the types. Now what we're gonna do is as we sort of look at how the program works, we're gonna generate some constraints on these types that relate how the, how the different values connect with each other. And the key intuition over here is a kind of classic idea. It's been used in sort of data flow analysis. I'm sure Ron is teaching some variant of it in his com compilers class. You are, aren't you, Ron? You must, yes. Okay, and the basic idea is this. This is like, if you remember, it's like, you know, from the Dragon Book. Um, whenever you have some set of objects, P, that are flowing into Q, and I'm using flow in a very nebulous kind of uh, informal way. Maybe you can think of it as 
the set of objects P is assigned to a variable X, or you can say take the set of objects B and you call some function, whatever, right? Whenever you have P flowing into Q, in the data flow analysis literature, we sort of generate a set constraint. So, you know, if you've taken any of these kind of live variable analysis or use def analysis, we say we get a set constraint that says that the set of objects inside P must be a subset of the objects that are inside Q, right? Because all the things in P flowed into Q, so this subset relationship must hold. So now in this refined land, basically the same idea holds, except that we replace the subset with an implication. Okay, so what we're going to say is whenever some values such that P flow into some values such that Q, it must be that the constraint for P implies the constraint for Q. Okay, so let's see how this intuition works in our example. Okay, so there are really two interesting flows over here. The first flow is where I have this variable I flowing in as the index operator that's into the get, get, whatever operator, right? So I flows into the index of X. The second interesting flow is where this collection I's that we, that we generated up there is flowing into the body via the map function. Right? We have this collection of, in, of uh, things that we generated using range and that is flowing in, in, into the body. Okay? So let's see what kinds of constraints we get for those. The first one is for the I flowing into the array bounds. And now what we're going to say is, well, the type of I was K of I. And uh, for, as it flows into the index, it must be that k of i implies that i must be between 0 and the length of x. Right? As the precondition of the index function, we require that the index i is, is between 0 and the length of x. So far, so good? So k of i must imply this. The second constraint we're going to get is from this map of body of i's. So here, i's is flowing into body. right? And so what is i's? i's is a, is a list of objects such that this condition holds. And that is flowing into body. And what is body's input parameter? k of i. And so you get this constraint that blah, 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 blah. i greater than 0, i less than something implies k of i. OK? And so that's basically it. You get these two horn constraints. Actually, you get like 50 others, but I'm not showing them. Okay? These are the two interesting constraints that you get from this particular system. And now what's going to happen is we want to solve for k. We want to find, hmm, can you squint at this and can you find some solution for k such that both of these implications hold at the same time? Okay? And there's a process by which, you know, there's a least fixed point, blah, blah, blah. There's a long story. But long story short, you can sort of solve out for these horn constraints. There are various different algorithms to do it that I'm not going to tell you about. But here is a solution. I can solve k of v to be value greater than 0 and values less than v and x minus 1. It's not surprising. If you look at it, literally all I'm doing is taking this and setting it to be the solution for k. Because this guy implies that. that I'm not, there's no magic here. Okay? In, in real programs, there does there need to be a little more magic, but not so in this one. Okay? So that's pretty much it. That's how the verification works. You start with the program, you do this kind of type checking, it generates these kind of horn constraints, and then you turn the crank, and those get solved out. I have 15 minutes, eh? Very well. Okay, fantastic. So how do we, can we only do array bounds checking? Can we do nothing else? It turns out that the same idea, now that we're in type land, you can go to town. You can really specify all kinds of, of fun properties. So here's a fun one. Um, I was, you know, while I was making this talk, I was working on this weird data structure that somebody made up called an interval set. It's probably, you've, most of you have probably at some point written a data structure that looks something like this, okay? It's a structure that's used to represent sets. Imagine, here's a set. 7, 1, 10, 3, 2, et cetera, et cetera. Why have I colored them peculiarly? Because if you squint at it, we can reorder them by color into a sequence. So it's actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 9 through 12. And now I can sort of compress each of the contiguous blocks into 1 through 5, 7 through 8, 9 to 13. Okay, starting with the low one and going up to but not including the upper one. Okay, so now how can I represent? So I took an arbitrary set of objects like this and I represented them in this compact fashion. Okay, so what does this look like as a type? Here's what it looks like. So I'm going to say an interval set, which is a set of A's, is either the empty, there's nothing else, okay, or it's a single interval which has a starting point called from. Think of this as a struct, right? The, it has a from field. It has a to field. So the from would be one, the two would be five, and then the rest of the interval set, okay? So the, this is the head. Think of it as one through five. One is the from, two is the five, and then the rest is that interval set down there, okay? Now, as you've seen just from this little example, there's actually lots of fun invariants on these interval sets. For example, 
we require various properties like, we want each of these blocks to be non-empty. I don't want to write one one because that's like, like an empty interval, that's silly, okay? So how would I specify that? I would say from is whatever, the two value must be greater than from, strictly greater than the from, so I have at least one element. Here's another interval uh, invariant that says that every element inside the tail, inside the rest, must be, strict, must be greater than or equal to two. And now you have to think about this for a little bit, but what this tells you is that every element inside the tail must be greater than all the elements over here, right? So they are disjoint from these. And furthermore, because I've tucked it inside the type, it means it holds recursively all the way down. And so now I've basically said that there's an ordered collection of blocks where each of the blocks is, is piecewise uh, distinct, okay? So that's pretty much it. This is, all, this is what you have to write. This is the extra bit you have to write to specify the various properties. Yes, question. This is more just to see if I understand what you're saying. Doesn't that actually allow me to have two ranges that are, could be combined? It does. Okay. You're absolutely right. Okay. And I'm very happy to, that you asked that because it means I've not been, I've not been completely incomprehensible at this point. <laughs> very good, very good. I did not put this in deliberately. This was a mistake I made. This does not prevent what you're saying. Thank you. Okay, cool. So now let's see, um, um, right, so here's, so let's look at a couple of examples, right? So this is bad because why? It's eight five is empty, right? The from must be less than the two. So that's because I was an ass and I should have written five eight and I flip that around, it's like, okay, that's cool. Here's another one. Um, I might say something like, um, I set one through seven and then five through eight, there's an overlap, right? And they're not disjoint and so you want to tweak that and so that should be seven one five, like so. And now again, it's all good, okay? Here's one last example. These are all disjoint, one, five, nine, 13, seven, eight. But this is rejected because they're not well ordered, right? We really need, we need the ordering because the algorithms that then operate on the sets rely on the ordering in various ways. Uh, this is not ordered and so again I would go in and I have to flip that around. That should be nine, 13, that should be seven and eight. And then after that the system is quite happy, okay? Of course, the point of this kind of type system is not to write these things one by one, I can kind of eyeball them. Instead, the goal is to actually make programming with these sets pleasant, right? So here's a function that, for example, computes the union of two sets. And it's a somewhat, I don't want to say hairy, because if you squint at it, it's actually very pretty, but it does look a little scary, right? There's various cases, it's sort of traversing the two sets, doing various things. And when I wrote the first version of the function, I actually got it wrong because the vanilla type checker is not very useful because everything is an integer over here, right? From and to, they're all just numbers. So how do I know that I didn't use the wrong number? And in fact, I made a typo over here. This T2 should actually have been something else, right? It ought to have been a T1. And the moment I go and check it to a T1, it's like, yeah, okay, then it's all good, okay? So this is the kind of programmer feedback that I would like as I'm developing, not like two days later. And just to sort of emphasize that this was not an entirely frivolous function to check, that this property was actually quite non-trivial. I borrowed this from Joaquin Breitner, who sort of wrote the first version of this, and he even sort of used an interactive theorem prover to verify these same ordering invariants. Um, but Joaquin had to do a fair bit of work. Okay, so here is, here is his cock proof. It sort of it says the same thing up at the top. Cock is an interactive proof assistant that's fantastic for many different things, but not so great for proving properties about interval sets, as you shall see. Here is all the stuff they had to write. It's like a 100 line proof, it goes on and on. I don't pretend to really understand what that proof is doing. All I know is that I didn't have to write it. Um, I just had to write this, which was the code, right, for, for implementing the union function. Okay, clickety-click, this is great. Okay, fantastic. So we have 10 minutes, and even though I cut like a third of my talk, I guess I should have cut two thirds of it. Um, okay, cool, so here, let me just summarize some, you know, we've sort of used this system, we've checked uh, various things, these are, various data structures, many of these are low level string manipulating libraries, which are interesting because even though Haskell, which is the language this thing is built for, is uh, you know high level functional language, when you need stuff to be fast, you have to write it in C, okay? There's, that's just how the world is. And all of the fast uh, string manipulation libraries are actually all in C, and all this, and there's essentially, core bits are written in C, and then the rest of the Haskell is doing fancy pointer arithmetic on top of it, right? So you can get seg faults with Haskell, you can get uh, uh, you know, all of that good stuff, right? And so it turns out that you know, with, with, uh, with the system you can sort of specify pointer arithmetic and you can check it all out. Um, the nice thing is that the specification burden is quite modest. It's roughly comparable to the, you know, just regular type specification. So about one line of spec per 10 lines of code, which is roughly comparable to what you do with Haskell as well, okay? So that's all I'm gonna say about verification and then I'm gonna jump a whole section and if you learn nothing else from this, you must learn about sections inside Keynote, <laughs> which make it very easy to jump stuff. Okay, so let me 
So the uh, thing that I skipped is you can essentially take the system and scale it up to not just check things like ordering and array bounds, but you can sort of scale it up to check arbitrary properties of code. For example, that same union function, in reality, if I was really paranoid, I would want to check, I would want to define a notion of what is the actual set of elements that each interval corresponds to. And then I want to prove that the union function actually behaves equivalently to the mathematical union function. Right? And you, know, you can do things like that and many other things besides. But I want to summarize, I, I want to just sort of conclude by um, you know, telling you about some of the lessons that we've learned in the course of this. Right? So I sum them up roughly with these. So one is that language is not very relevant. It's not entirely true, but I'm just going to sort of, uh, uh, what do they say, exaggerate for emphasis. Second is that verification is actually, you know, once you use this kind of type directed style, it becomes ridiculously easy. It's, it's, it's a bit, yeah, it's, it's really nice. But what becomes very, very hard is explaining how the thing works, or rather explaining why the thing fails. Okay, so let me just briefly say why language is somewhat orthogonal. Okay, the only things that the method that I described relies upon is that you have functions, well, everybody's got functions, um, that you have some nice way of specifying data types in your language. It's a year 2019, you should have a nice way to specify data types in your language. Even JavaScript has really nice ways of specifying data types in the language now, with things like TypeScript and Flow. And you should have parametric polymorphism. It is 2019, all languages should have parametric polymorphism, but guess what, some don't. Anyway, maybe next year they will. Um, so anyway, we developed this for a bunch of different languages, including for C and for JavaScript. The functional languages turn out to be really easy. In the non-functional languages like C and JavaScript and so on, you have to kind of work very hard to make them feel functional so that you can use a type system. That's the highest level bit. Um, and you know, my, I have sort of friends at other places who've been sort of applying similar ideas to, for example, Racket and to Scala. Okay. Um, the thing I want to say is, that, okay, verification is easy once you use this kind of type-directed style. And what do I mean by this type-directed style? What I mean is where the abstractions that the analysis is making align nicely with the abstractions that the programmer is making about their code. That sounds vague. Let me give you a couple of examples, okay? So here's, here are three things that are just considered hard for program verification. How do we find the right invariants? How do we even write invariants about things like lists and data structures and so on and so forth? How do you do shape analysis so that you can talk about things that are on the heap? And how do you do context sensitivity? Okay, so if I have a function that's called from 50 different places, maybe I need to say different things about how this function behaves at each of those 50 places, right? Roughly speaking, that's what context sensitivity is. It turns out all of these things become really easy once you think, as, think with types. So for example, um, there's been, there was like a whole, I don't know, 15 years, 20 years of work trying to describe, come up with logics for describing the contents of heap data structures, like linked lists. Imagine I have a linked list, and I just want to say every element in the list is greater than zero. Okay, some of this, well, I think Alan was also involved in some of this, uh, in, in some of these logics, right? It turns out it's really complicated. Why? Because you have this pesky for all. You have to talk about what is this next star? It means the pointers that you can reach as you go down the heap, et cetera, et cetera. In the type world, you don't even blink when you see this. It's so obvious. It's like I, L is a list. It's a list of numbers, all of which are greater than zero. Right? All that nastiness about the next stuff is all tucked inside the list data constructor. Of course, this is changing the way you program. You can't do low-level pointer manipulations, but that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the price you're paying over here. It makes verification super easy if you work with these nice algebraic data types. Um, similar, you know, this sort of scales up nicely. Like intervals are ordered. I don't know if there was, you know, people were, had to design very, very specific shape analyses. You don't have to do any of that stuff because you can tuck it nicely inside the type. And now the type structure is getting you all this information about the intervals are non-empty and non-overlapping and ordered. It's, it, I mean, it feels like, what is, the, what is the expression? Taking candy from a child. Um, <clears throat> here's another example with context sensitivity. It's a, really a painful thing with a lot of program analysis. In, the, in this world where you're working with types, it becomes super easy because you use parametric polymorphism. So the map function has this funny type. It says, for all A and B, if you give me a function that turns apples to bananas, a list of apples, and I'll give you back a list of bananas, right? And now it's up to the system to figure out what's the apple and what's the banana at each call site. And again, once you do this refinement thing, it works out just, it just figures out the right refinements uh, in, during the constraint solving. I'm going to sort of skip and get to what I think is the really important part. Oh, five minutes off, plenty. Fantastic. What is really, really hard? is explanation. And what do I mean by explanation? This is what I mean. 
It means that we did all this stuff. Much of the nice thing you saw is that the programmer wrote very little, right? They just wrote these specs and choo -choo -choo, pink stuff came up, choo -choo, pink stuff went away. Fantastic. The system was doing a lot of work under the covers to figure out, for example, as you pointed out, hey, it just said int. Well, you read int, but actually the system figured out that it was not just an int, it was a nat, and it was a nat that was between low and the high of the vector, right? So that was that constraint solving doing a lot of that work. That's all great when it works, but it's kind of a real pain when it doesn't work. And when does it not work? When you have an error, right? Everyone's happy as long as the code is correct. But if the system doesn't like your code, then it's like, it's, you know, it's like, why? Why? Why do you not like it? So the simple case is when your code is wrong. Okay, like in the example we saw, except that it took like a room full of 50 very clever computer scientists, uh, uh, you know, a fair bit of thinking to figure out that, aha, those errors were because there was a, you know, the array might be empty there. So it would be really cool if there was some kind of mechanism to generate counterexamples that said, hey, that's wrong because you might have an empty array. Okay, so that would be a cool thing. This is plausible. I think we have ways to do this. We just need to do it, right? What's harder, though, is this problem that we were sort of vaguely alluding to around lunchtime, is when the code is correct. What do I mean the code is correct? It means that given what spec you had, given the code that you have, whenever you run the code, it does exactly the same thing that the spec says. There is no actual array bounds error, right? So you can't, there's no counterexample, but the system can't prove the property because the spec is weak. What do I mean? An example of that would be the uh, integer overflow. Right? So remember the first time we got this crazy integer overflow where everything was bad, and then we had like, oh, wait, we had to specify that vector lengths are all are bounded, right? Where did that come from? How did I pull that out of thin air, right? So somehow I had to communicate this to the system. I know this because I set up that example, but you know, uh, someone else would be just completely baffled. So how do we pinpoint exactly which function or where you know, information is getting lost? And the hardest is, I have no way to describe this other than the analysis is weird. Here's an example that will make sense only to the programming languages people in the room, if that. So this is insertion sort, okay? If you can't recognize the sort function takes x, recursively sorts the tail, inserts x into the tail. Here's the insert function. How do I insert x into the empty list? It's just the list x. Otherwise, I compare x and y, and I, if x is less than y, stick it in front. Otherwise, recursively insert x into y's, put y. It's pretty standard insertion sort. I'm just checking, I'm writing an assertion over here that checks that this function is only called with sorted lists. So I'm calling sort of x's and then I'm calling the check function. So the check function is walking over to verify that at each point x1 is less than the next fellow. Okay? In case you don't like my type specification, here I'm writing it as an old fashioned assertion. But the system says, I can't prove this assertion for you. I think this assertion might fail. And you stare at it and you're like, wow, I'm pretty sure this insertion sort. I ran all the tests, it all works out. And then it turns out that the problem here is this type signature, where I say it works only for lists of integers. Guess what? This doesn't work just for lists of integers. It works for lists of anything. And so if you, in fact, delete that particular type signature, it tells the system, hey, this works for all A's. If you give me a list of all A's, and remember how I said parametric polymorphism unlocks the weapon of context sensitivity. In the PL world, we call this parametricity. It's a fancy word. Essentially, once you delete that type signature, you're saying, hey, that's actually a polymorphic function. And the system says, oh, it's a polymorphic function. Well, then, in that case, various cool things happen, and the system checks it out, right? I mean, look, there's no polite way to say this. This is kind of strange and weird, OK? It's a strange consequence of how the tool works, of basically the tool's cleverness. It's what you would call too clever by half. And so how do we get the programmer to understand this kind of thing? You need somehow a mental model, and right now, the best way we have a mental model is this time should be like a PhD dissertation. There's like <laughs> six years, and somehow nirvana happens there. And the thing I'd like to figure out is how to flatten that particular curve. And I think what we need is, one, how, what kind of mistakes do people make in practice? We need much more information on this. Two, somehow we need to figure out how to make the analysis more transparent, for lack of a better term. Try and again, just explain why, it, you know, why it's doing what it's doing. And three, perhaps one and two are not that important. Maybe what's really important is just to figure out ways to explain this properly, to somehow figure out how can you just get programmers using this, because they will, you know, like undergraduates, hapless undergraduates. It's kind of fun. You know, every time you get that little green check, there's a little adrenaline thing. <laughs> I mean, it's not silly. All of you are looking at Facebook right now, scrolling, looking for a like. It's kind of like a like, you know? Um, that's what we need. We need to like it up. OK, so that's basically it. Um, I want to thank a bunch of other people who are working in the same space. And I want to thank all the students who actually did all the work. 
um, all of these fine folks. And let me just stop right here and conclude with language integrated verification. I want the programmer to influence the analysis, and I want the analysis to influence the program. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
but you don't put everything together and so I don't really have an end-to-end -end correctness property that I can even think about checking all at once. Um, in the hardware world, it's just much more common for various historical reasons to have monolithic things that you want to check things about. So I think these social things are different. Um, but I think coming back to the software world, the things I showed you have this kind of simple flavor, partly because that's the easiest things to show you. You can kind of scale it up with more work, as it were, right? So, um, yeah, I don't, does that, does that really make sense? I think the reason you're willing to wait one more day is part, is largely because of A, there's cost, and B, you have no choice in the matter, right? Um, in the software world, yeah, you can just like skip a lot of these bugs and ship them, you know, and deal with them, you know, end, uh, sort of end days later. I think that's, that has to do with it. Uh, that's my guess. And I guess the third thing is that, yeah, you don't have parts or functions that you want to, ch in the hardware world, it's not like I'm just going to check this one very long module at a time. Because I don't have a, I can't check the end-to-end -end correctness of that, right? That, that's my hunch. Yeah. Let's say I want to scale up the analysis to something which is harder mathematically than bound checking. Yeah. Not as hard as simulating hardware, mm -hmm. but where I know that I actually need a theorem prover because I use some kind of statements that are known from analysis, whatever, and I have them in a, in a proof yeah. uh, checking library. Mm -hmm. How hard is it to incorporate that into refinement time? Do you have another R? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm kidding. Um, it's not hard at all. That's the segment of the talk I skipped. So um, as it turns out, it's not that hard. Um, I don't know how to give you a short answer to that, to that question. Um, think of it like this. I probably have one slide. No, I can't. I, I'll try to explain it without slides. It's not hard at all because of, um, what's a good explanation? The way to think about it is, what you end up doing is, whenever you have these really difficult facts, okay, what you end up doing is, you turn these difficult facts into functions. The code of that function, I'm going to say two words and just nod if you know what these words mean. It's kind of like a shibboleth. Curry Howard. Do you know what these words mean? Okay, cool. So the reason it's not so hard is because of Curry Howard. Long story short, you take these really complicated facts and the facts become new types and the implementations of those types become proofs of those facts. You can write these implementations essentially by calling out to other facts which now just become lemmas. Right? That, that's the, the long story short. And so you can take the system that I described and turn it into a theorem prover pretty much like so. All you have to do is when you have some complicated function, imagine a function that's simulating hardware, you just say the specification for that function is the definition of that function. You just literally take the definition of that function and say the post condition is an output state that is described by the body of that function. Just automatically. And once you do that, then everything else kind of works out very naturally. Because every call to that function is essentially telling you how that function is defined. And then via Curry Howard, let me just wave my hand. Uh, since you're nodding, I'm just going to assume you know what Curry Howard is. Um, you can write these proofs and they're quite nice. That's the, the short answer. But I can, you know, I'm happy to take this offline and explain more later. Yeah? I think we had uh, one over here first. Ah, that was yes. <coughs> can you explain a little bit more about how you find the K function? Because you might have a lot of different Ks that all satisfy the constraints and you have to choose one that... That's a very good question. That works for whatever specification you want to verify. Excellent. So um, you're absolutely right. There are many different Ks that are valid solutions. <coughs> so what we do is, um, concretely what we do is, again, I'm going to say some words and you can kind of nod if you know what these words mean. Um, we, we sort of define a space of solutions for the case. Okay, so think of the space of solutions as, imagine I have a set of candidate predicates, let's just call them P1 through P100, and the space of solutions is defined as conjunctions of subsets of those predicates. So if you have 100 pre possible predicates, then you have two to the 100 possible subsets, and so two to the possible 100 possible conjunctions, roughly speaking, right? Now what we do is, we find the strongest solution to, those, to, the, to the case that is expressible in this space. Roughly speaking, that's what we do, right? So we start by, roughly we pretend that we set all the k's to false. False is the conjunction of the empty set of, uh, of predicates. And then we keep taking, hey, is this constraint satisfied? No, okay, let's weaken it. Let's add, you know, let's, let's drop some conjunct so that now this predicate becomes satisfied. And we keep sort of repeating this process over the space until either all the constraints are satisfied, in which case are like, great, we found a solution, or we're in this world where um, the constraints cannot be satisfied over the given sort of domain, what is called an abstract domain. So that's, 
you know, without getting into more technical details, that's roughly what we do. It's called predicate abstraction. Okay. There were some hands. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, you start off <laughs> talking about the great wall between programming and verification. <clears throat> you know, and the why the wall is there is because, you know, people have always been cautious, wary about telling the programmer that they have to do something else, like add annotations or assertions. So both the, you, want, you don't want the programmers to kind of change their paradigm. And, uh, and you're also worried about programmer sophistication. And so it's like, yeah, the only way we're actually going to be able to deploy verification is if we don't assume too much about the programmer, both their sophistication and their willingness to put in stuff in the code that they wouldn't normally, right? Uh, so, but you make this great case. No, no, let's do it. Let's, let's let them add stuff. And the very last slide is, ah, actually, the programmer is the hard part again. Uh, their sophistication and uh, certainly their ability to understand your system and to write sort of reasonable assertions in, in, in your part. Um, so you get back to the same thing. What I want to know is, but it's a beautiful, beautiful tool. Um, so what I want to know is, what do you think the kind of killer apps, the killer segments of code are? You're never going to get the undergraduate. I mean, never's a long time. Let's just say it's going to be a really long time before a typical undergraduate, typical software programmer is able to use your system. Um, but there are PhDs, there are smart people who will and will love it. So for them, what should they, what should they be coding? Well, they, they being the smart people? The smart people who can use your system right now and for the next 10 years, uh, you know, it's not going to be every program. What's, what's this really for? So, okay, so let me rewind. First of all, I have to say I reject your assertion. <laughs> okay? Um, I don't think programmers are a kind of unmalleable object um, that they don't like annotation. I think that's just not true. I think people don't like annotations if they don't see a point to those annotations. So really, my, the way, so I mean, this, I, I'll, I'll try to address this. These are all great questions, right? So I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Um, I think people like annotations as long as there's, if you give me a reason to do something, if there's enough payoff, I will do annotations. And by the way, this is not just me. This is Manu Sridharan's Uber thing as well, right? So a lot of the thing they had earlier, they stripped out. They had, the, they had an analysis where it, you had to write far fewer annotations. And programmers said, you know what? This is slower. We get our feedback tomorrow. I want my feedback now. I will write annotations for it. Okay. So it's just not your evidence. So that's, I think that's concrete evidence. So those, that if you give me a reason to write annotations, people will write annotations. So that's one. Two, um, you are right. It's not, so there are, I think, some domains where, as to return to Alan's point, there is a bigger bang for the buck, right? Where the things you care about are really severe, um, and the annotations you have to write are not that great, so you just want to do it. So I think things like, you know, pointer safety, things like that are just like, you know, are, are, are there. There's another one I didn't mention in all these fancy languages. So for example, there's one kind of basic checking that our system does without you writing anything at all, and that is it checks that code terminates, oddly enough, and it checks that you're handling all the patterns, right? So and it checks all of these, and this it just does without you asking for asking it to do anything, right? And that again is, I think, a cause of a lot of bugs, right? So it turns out that, you know, people want this. Now when I say people, so you're right, I did come back to this explanation is hard, partly because to me, you know, this weird thing I showed you with insert sort is kind of a pathological corner case that I find very interesting, and I thought it would be interesting to see this totally weird thing. The reality of it is, I'm actually surprised by how well undergrads can deal with this stuff. So I have been very cautiously throwing it at undergrads at UCSD um, and graduate students, and I'm pretty shocked at how well they're able to deal with it, actually. Um, it's a bit mind-moggling to me. So I genuinely think that um, the, main, the main problems are, it's not so much that people are not willing to write annotations. It is that if I give you instant feedback, with the annotations, then you're like, yeah, what have I got to lose? You're like, oh, I'm going to be told about array overflow. I don't have to write tests that, you know, to check the thing. We're like, sure, why not? I don't have to write a lot. So that's one. And two, I think it's really the, the what is the word I want? The pedagogy, right? There's, we don't, you know, when we teach this kind of formal stuff, we mainly teach it for graduate students who want to build tools like this. There isn't, and there are textbooks that are aimed at undergraduates, but they're all about, 
well, let's check that insertion sort is correct or whatever, the kind of example I had. But you know what, that's boring, you know? I mean, we really need to figure out a way to, and this, this I, so this is what I was alluding to as the pedagogy. I want to figure out what's a cool way to teach this where it's not about verification, it's about actually building whatever you wanted to build, but that where this kind of technology makes it easier. And for that, you know, honestly, I don't have a, I don't have a super good answer for that. You know, I'm thinking data structures maybe because um, this is very good for that, but yeah, I'm open to suggestions. Yeah, uh, one question back here first. But that's a very good question. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, I guess to what I was wondering here is that, is that most of your examples are uh, in, uh, you know, uh, uninterpreted functions and, and in your uh, arithmetic and not some of the more interesting decision procedures that are in, in the SMB solvers these days. Uh, how far into that have you gone? Like, have you, have you added finite data types and sets and... Yes, string. yes, yes. Here's a question. Oh, sorry, let me repeat the question. The question is all the examples I had were just uh, uninterpreted functions, linear arithmetic, I mean, just, just for ordering, people, correct. For, for, for motivating it to the user. Right, if right. Perfect, so, um, you're getting the user excited about right. check this new thing. Um, that's absolutely right. Integer overflows so much, right? What's <laughs> they that? They just don't care about integer overflows so much. I think RT would beg to differ, first of all. Um, but uh, <laughs> no. That's right. So, um, so you're absolutely right. So, in in a sense, we're completely agnostic to the SMT, to the decision procedure, uh, to the actual logics. The actual tool has, you know, plays quite nicely with sets. Uh, what else did you say? Uh, ADTs. Uh, the third one was string, so all of these are there. Uh, they just get, the examples get more involved, so they're not in this talk, but it's all there, and there are examples for all of that in the thing. The only thing, there's one thing that I do obsess about that is not, that was not in this talk, which is I insist that it's in the decidable fragment. Yeah. I do not like quantifiers. Okay. So other than that, as long as it's in the decidable fragment, I'm quite happy, mm -hmm. and all of these are supported. The, the, I sort of had a second. I like sets. So sets actually, by the way, to uh, return to Alan's thing about range, that's how you encode Allen's property about it's the set of elements between N and M, is you use the set theory for that. I find set theory is way more compelling for people in this type of thing because they, they're, they're, it's much more like um, reasoning through the cases. That, right. You know, it ranges pretty much everyone always just does a single, right. single range, right? Two endpoints, whereas there's, there's, there's all sorts of complicated right. in this set but not in that set. Right. In the <coughs> section too, so. so for example, the same insertion sort example that I showed you, it takes essentially one more line to specify that the output list returned by insertion sort has the same set of elements as the input list. Literally just the same set, it takes nothing. You just have to like, say, you have to define what it means to be the set of elements in a list, but once you do that, you're all good. And sort of related uh, for the instant feedback, you want to stay inside decidable, but a lot of the decision procedures nevertheless kind of fall off. <coughs> I mean, it's like decidable, like if, you, if you've waited a long time. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, have you got a guideline or sense of, of where the, the cliffs are? I have, to, I, have to, I have to pause because I, one of my favorite quotes is from Alan. I have to tell you the story. Alan has forgot, he's heard this a couple of times. When I was a grad student, um, Alan came and gave a talk. And you know, a talk like this, I was in, at Berkeley and um, he gave this talk, it was about symbolic execution. And I was like a freshman graduate student at the time, right? And someone in the audience said, but professor, who are you not, because it was like exploring paths and so on. And, are you not concerned that there is an exponential blow up in the number of possible paths that your system is exploring? And Alan sort of, he, he patiently sighed and he said, ah, young man, in the verification world, when something is decidable, we don't worry about little things like exponentials. <laughs> This was maybe, it was maybe the first technical talk I went to, so it just stuck with me. Sorry, Alan, I thought I had to share. But sorry, you were saying. That's exactly my question. Uh, how, how and have you managed to tame that fact? Like, um, you know, we don't have, so I think the short answer, I, I don't have a super crisp answer to that. I will say this, that you know, in each of the things I was showing you, it was making thousands, maybe millions of SMT queries to do this kind of thing. The thing, there are a couple of things we do that is nice though. One is that SMT solvers essentially sort of fall off the cliff if there's a lot of disjunctions, right? So when there's case splitting, bad things happen. And we've basically rigged things up so that there's no case splitting. So um, all the case splitting that happens, happens 
by, is done by the programmer. You use algebraic data types, you want to do a case split, guess what, you did a case off expression or a match with expression or whatever, and that's where the case splits happen. Other than that, the bulk of the queries are actually all sort of conjunctions of, uh, just sort of conjunctions of atomic predicates. And so they're all, you know, they don't really tickle the SAT solver that much. I think that's, that's, I, I, that's the most technical answer I can give you. But we rarely, we don't have an SMT timeout because we just sort of stay in this happy theory and happy theories, right, which are all fast. I, you don't, I don't have like floating points in there, for example. And String dirtles, all that stuff is fast. You precede this, this set of predicates that, that it explores the possible conjunctions of? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And those are just yeah. scraped from the, they're just scraped from all the stuff I was typing. So again, remember when I said the programmer tells the analysis how to go about its business? Every time you write a specification, it's like, hmm, I see you like that predicate. I'm just going to throw it in that set. That's all that happens. You don't actually write anything else. Um, back related to the query from the back, um, a bit of a language question. You know, you had your specification <coughs> stuff in the braces. Right? Ah, yes. Now, that's, <laughs> is, is the notation inside that braces dependent <coughs> on the program <coughs> notation, or have you got a single notation? <coughs> for your prover that's independent of the programming language. Because uh, you you're working with Haskell, that's Haskell a, and with uh, Java, for example, JavaScript. Yeah. Um, they won't look the same, right, if it's... They won't. <laughs> Though, oddly, the thing that's mostly different between the Haskell and the JavaScript is the brace notation. Is, so it, w the thing was basically a comment. So in Haskell, you write a comment as a, Oh, check it out. <laughs> this is how you write a comment in Haskell. Right. Um, you know, so it's like in, how is it in C again? I've forgotten now. Uh, somebody help me. It's like, I know this one. Oh, right, this one. Right, so that's the C thing. <laughs> I would have failed this test. Okay, um, so anyway, in Haskell it's like this, C is like this, JavaScript is like this, right? A C also is like this. So really, the main difference between the Haskell and the JavaScript uh, sort of specification notations is that in Haskell, I tell this, so I, I want it to just be plain Haskell code, right, other than my specs. So in Haskell, I write the spec as, oh, I see some things don't change even in Canada. Okay. Um, so the, I, I write it like that. In C, I write, in C and JavaScript, I write it like that. So it's really just the comment syntax. Much of the stuff inside stays the same. And this is largely due to laziness on my part. I have the same parser that just works on all three. And I basically did all the, the bulk of the engineering is for the Haskell thing. So I just try to parse things that look kind of like Haskell code, and the C and the JavaScript tools essentially have to parse, you know, just like write it like Haskell. Part of the issue with getting the programmer to accept the whole thing is if yeah. he gets to write in his, in his notation, which is yeah. the programming language, yeah. then he's a happier candidate <coughs> if he has to write That's right. um, spec notation. That's what right. Which one are you really offering here? Is it a spec notation or is it, uh, is it truly he's writing in the programming language his specs? So, Okay, so first of all, the other, the C and the Java, the JavaScript ones were more proof of concept. I have decided life is short and I need to pick one of these things to focus on, so I'm just gonna pick on the Haskell one as the bulk of my engineering, right? So that's one. And so then the bulk of our work is essentially focused on, on that. And there we essentially let you write specs mostly now as Haskell code. Right. You write, here's a little Haskell function, you write one of these little things on top that say, this is a spec. The thing that I just wrote below is a spec, treat it as a spec, right? So, so that you just mostly write Haskell. And you know, in some day in the future, you won't even have to write this, but you know, that day is still in the far future now. But you're right. People even freak out about the fact that it's comments. I just don't understand why, why you would care. But everybody is like, it's a comment. We don't like to see comments. Can you please put it inside the compiler? Well, because right? they want the compiler to check the specs syntactically. Yeah, but the thing is, anyway, yeah. yeah. You're right. I know. I just, it's like a. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I think my question is, I think more of an implementation aspect. But I still wanted to ask because the main selling point about your works, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that it's the scalability of this aspect that you're sort of combining uh, your language thing with the verification aspect and combining these two can actually lead to solving a lot of safety problems, right? But I'm still a little skeptical about the horn clause aspect because if you look at cyber systems or IP systems, they have a lot of code. So even if you do predicate abstraction, it'll still lead to a problem of overestimation because they'll be like, to how much can you do? So if you are able to do that, 
how do you like and then the third part was proofs that actually makes it sort of scalable so do you think that this is possible in like huge like huge numbers because i'm still a little skeptical about the haunt clause i know you explained it that you do some things mm -hmm. but i i'm not sure if it will lead to some <coughs> Well, um, that's a good question. Let's see. I, let me see. Let me try and answer it as best as I can. So you're right. The horn clause stuff actually just goes back to predicate abstraction. It's just it's what it's like a fancy way of saying predicate abstraction now. So, and I worked on you know I, I, back in the day I, I worked on C on, on building sort of tools like this, but for C. And one of the things we found there, one of the I mean I, I thought it was a, a cute thing, right? Is that you would have a pretty large C program, maybe tens of thousands of lines or whatever. And in the course of sort of analyzing that C program, you would maybe require tens or hundreds of predicates. OK, so it was doing a similar kind of computation to what I'm describing here, perhaps even more heavyweight. You would need sort of tens or hundreds of predicates across the whole program. And so the sort of uh, combinatorics are awful, right? If you have hundreds of 500 predicates, you're trying to, like the space is true of the 500. Oh my god, what's going to happen, right? But the thing that we found in that work is that why you need 500 predicates in the whole program, in any one point of the program, there's actually only four or five important facts. And so if you can whittle down, if you can somehow figure out which facts are important at each particular point, then you're in business. So again, coming back to the examples here, the kind of larger code bases we're looking at, they use like hundreds of hundreds of predicates. In fact, it's not hundreds of it's hundreds of predicate fragments, where a fragment has a sort of wild card for a for a variable, right? Imagine I say star is less than star. Now star could be any of you know if I have five thousand variables, that's like five thousand times five thousand, right? So that seems like an astronomical number, except that at any one point in time, there's only so many variables that are in scope. There's only so many ways I could instantiate it. There's only so many of those variables that have the right types. Once you whittle everything down. If, you, if your program is sort of reasonably well scoped, if your program is not like 5,000 global variables all happily sort of you know, modifying each other and so on, as long as it's somewhat modular, it turns out that the horn clause thing also kind of essentially picks up on that. And so each individual horn clause, they're very sparse. So basically you have hundreds of these horn clauses, but the solutions are actually quite sparse. It's like, oh, two or three here, two or three there, and so on. So that's why, that why, that's why it works. <clears throat> OK, so we're a little bit over time. Uh, if Anyone else would like to stay, ask questions offline. We have some time in the schedule. Uh, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.